I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and co-owner of PurePleasureShop.com. I'm April, VP of the cutting-edge sex toy company Hot Octopus, and I dedicate my life to the business of sex. We are on a mission to teach you how to have hot sex, deep intimacy, and how to make your own rules for who you are as a sexual being. Welcome Welcome to to the the Shameless Sex Revolution. Want to learn more? Go to shamelesssex.com. And for 50% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use code SHAMELESSSEX at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Well, hello, everyone. Hiya, folks. Hey, folks. Hey, friends. Hey. How you doing? Welcome to the Shameless Sex Podcast. I love the title of this episode, Gender Fuck. Do you remember how you doing, friends? You? Oh. <laughs> I just watched this episode Joey? one, two, and three episodes, all of those. You're watching Friends again? I did. Oh, that's it, cute. It actually brings me joy sometimes. It's a joyful one. I remember when I was watching that in the 90s, and... There's not a lot of shadows in there. No, not it's a lot pretty of darkness. light. Yeah. Not a lot of like, I'm having a really hard time. Yeah. I'm looking at my trauma and all my shame. Not like Full House. That was full of trauma. No. They yeah, were like, yeah, yeah. The, the sad mm-hmm. music would start. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we just date ourselves. All the 18 year olds are like, what's Full House? What Maybe are you not. About? They might know. I don't know. Anyways, this episode with Ray McDaniel. Can we say Dr. Ray McDaniel? I, th- I believe so. I actually, are they a doctor? I don't know. I may have made that up. We're going they to should the probably be a doctor because the amount of information that was incredibly insightful in this episode, it was I learned uh, incredible I learned so much, and I'm not going to say the word incredible again, it's but that's a great incredible adjective. Incredible, how much you learned about being incredible. It it's was. really incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, genderfuck, transgender, non-binary, and transitioning 101. Guess what, y'all? It's Pride Month. It's June 2021 in this exact moment. Uh, so, if you're listening to this in the future, well, it may not be June anymore, but we are here to celebrate and inform and educate and create awareness around Pride Month, LGBTQIA plus. Ray is so knowledgeable. Incredible speaker. <laughs> Incredibly insightful. If April hasn't already sold you on Ray. <laughs> they have a PhD in incredibility. They actually wrote the movie Incredibles. They're uh, part of it. <laughs> their screenplay. Uh, so before we dive in, we have a sex question for you. We will read a bio. We also would like to ha- give you a special announcement about a free offering. Free, 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 free event. This upcoming weekend, I believe, on the 12th, right? That's this weekend, mm-hmm. Saturday. Uh, so Dr. Willow Brown, dear, dear friend, and she was a guest on episode number she's been on uh, several episodes three yeah. and was just a guest on, on number 220 kidney orgasms liver orgasms and sex is medicine and that's not exactly what her free event is about it's called dreaming the queen awake a sensual and sexual empowerment online retreat so to learn more go to dr willow brown's website that's dr dr willowbrown.com you'll see a dreaming the queen awake module piece that you click on on the website and you can learn more again it's free go check it out willow's awesome and if you haven't heard her episode go to number 220 she's, i feel like a dear, a dear sister to us she's wonderful yeah. i love her to death and i'm still trying to learn how to have that kidney orgasm i don't know or a liver orgasm oh yeah i was like i think my liver needs some <laughs> orgasms <laughs> something's happening in there <laughs> all right are you ready for a sex question Chip? yes please all right My husband and I have been together 15 years and we have a terrific sex life. We share needs and desires openly and we support each other unconditionally. One fantasy we've discussed recently is a MFM, so male, female, male, threesome, in which the the men are biflexible. So, oh, that sounds real fun. We've enjoyed FMF threesomes and we want to try something new. And he's ready and willing. Now the trick is finding the one. We don't have any friends who fit the bill And we haven't had much luck through websites. All of my threesome experiences have been with friends or acquaintances, but we don't appear to have any links with bi guys. Do you have any advice to help us find a bi male who would like to play with us? Hmm. So my first thought is field, which we are big fans of, or I am actually. (laughs) You're kind of new to the field realm. Um, And I realize that it's hard to find your third, and field was designed for that, and they've already checked out some apps, so maybe... This didn't work for them. And maybe you haven't found the right app for you. Um, And they actually said websites, by the way. And so they're a little different, right? The websites, you have to create a whole online dating profile. The apps are a little more user-friendly and quick. And Field, F-E-E-L-D, 
was originally designed for this purpose, to find the third. You're already a couple and you're looking for someone else to play with, or you're a third looking for a couple. And it's grown beyond that. It's for folks who are kinky, for folks who want something a little different from traditional sex or mainstream sex, or for folks who might be a little traditional too. But um, the great thing about the, the app is that you create a profile and you actually click on the little boxes and write a description based on what it is that you're actually interested in. So they embrace your desires. And Which doing that together could also be a powerful be manifestation tool, Yeah, right? It's it, that I always think writing things or selecting things, especially if it's as a couple would be really helpful. And would I suggest a tip for navigating these spaces? So maybe you've already done field and it didn't work for you. Well, go back and here's what I would say if you haven't done this. Create two separate profiles. So your husband has a profile and you have a profile. Their first profile picture that you see on his profile is his face. But the description says, I'm in a relationship or I'm married and this is what we're looking for. He's very, very clear that he's looking for this. And then you have a profile also, the same thing, a picture of you, that same clear description. And you also on each profile have a picture of both of you together. So the people that are looking for you can be on either side of the spectrum perhaps, or they're all, I mean, I guess they're also, they're just looking for a specific type of threesome here. So yours would say you're looking, you're both, both of them actually say the same thing. We're looking for another man, but I'm in this committed relationship or this maybe committed is not your word. And we've experienced X, Y, and Z, and this is what we're looking for. And they make it really easy to specify this and be really clear. But I think what a lot of people do is they only create one profile and then they limit themselves from a lot of people that could find them. I didn't think about that. That's a good that's, that's a good suggestion. Well, Amy. I've been looking at fields, so I've seen this. I've oh, seen people. Better. It's funny on field because you'll see what, what what's interesting is one person will put their profile picture and then they will actually say, I'm so let's say it's a, a guy who's married or in a relationship with a woman, they're looking for a third. I'm in a committed relationship. I'm looking for a, we're looking for a third. Here's a photo of us together, and here's a link to her profile. And then you can go and see both of them and check in with both of them. And it's important to have your profile picture as we've, when we spoke to several different experts in uh, creating dating profiles, to have your picture that is the landing photo be something that is inherently you. And I would say, yeah, like, like not just your like, you know, arm or or some sunglasses or a hat, like make sure that it actually shows who you are, maybe some interest that you're in. Although you can describe that in here. They have the, there's little boxes. Mine would be me and Leggy. April would just be petting her dog. Yeah. I'd be like, this is Leggy. <laughs> like, she's gonna. Don't hit me up really if you don't like dogs. Because I love cats, dogs, all animals. Would you ever date someone who's not a dog person? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would not. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was a very confusing answer. I was like, what? Okay. Um, the last bit of advice I would have if you're really having a hard time with the online thing would be to go, it depends where you live, but go to environments where there's other open minded folks. So if you live, well, You probably don't live in like Chicago or San Francisco or New York. And if you do, awesome, because a lot of places in the COVID times are changing where these places are opening up. There's places that are, if you go to meetup.com, you can go and see all these places that are more geared towards poly people or tantra people. And you can go find just more open-minded folks. It might not be specifically designed for your type of threesome. And yet you can still go and meet more open-minded folks. It also yeah. seems like there's are there are groups or Facebook groups or different stuff. platforms yeah. where they can guide you. Some people might know more about the geographical locations where you can drop in and and find more folks that you're into or interested in yeah. or more that you you are the people that you're looking for. Yeah. That's why we all have to guide each other into the right places. Will you guide me, Chip? I'll guide you right in. Awesome. All um, right. Oh wait, but first. <laughs> I have something, a side note for you. And if that threesome perhaps involves all these glorious cocks, because this person is like, well, we're looking for two cocks uh, in this, and at the same time, you probably need a lot of lube. And if you're going to use that lube, I recommend Uber Lube. You know why, Chip? Why? Well, because it's absolutely fantastic. And notice how I didn't say incredible. Oh, shit. Well, it's also incredible. It is also incredible. I was just trying to use a different adjective to describe it. That's perfect. It's very <laughs> intelligent. It's long-lasting. It never gets sticky. It feels amazing. It feels luxurious on the skin. It has no flavor. It has no sense. Good for vaginal, oral, you know, all the holes, basically. I found one in my bed. Uh, I peeled up my sheets. What was in the bed? A bottle? A bottle was just floating around because <laughs> I didn't even know it was in there. This happened uh, last night and I was like, what is that on my back? Oh, it's Uber Lube. Don't remember. I probably used it a few days ago because I left town, but that's how much it doesn't leak. So it stayed in my bed. Noise. I put it on my nightstand and I have, 
I pretty much take it with me everywhere. It's in my cosmetic case because I love it so much. Do you have a travel kit or the travel bottle? That I do not. Go? Oh my God, I need to give you one. Yeah, what the hell? Oh, they have one in the metal case with a little glass I bottle in I, it. I definitely so know you have lube wherever you go. And it's undercover. It's lube. undercover lube. Everywhere you and go. And it protects it from breakage. Oh, it's the best lube ever. So, well, I can claim that I think it's the best lube ever. And if y'all want to try Uber Lube, just go to uberlube.com. Use coupon code SHAMELESSSEX. You get 10% off and free shipping. I have a feeling you will not regret it. And you can join the Uber Lube fan club. We're a part of it. Wait, just one shout out because today I was on my phone showing Amy a picture of something else and the owner popped up when we were all in Amsterdam together. And I was like, look. <laughs> Is that the owner of Uber Lube? I'm like, there's Steven. He's been on our show before too. Yeah. And he's fantastic. He's so, wonderful. Well, Ray <laughs> McDaniel, who also hails from Chicago, uh, let's learn about their bio. Ready, Amy? Yep. Ray McDaniel is a non-binary gender and sex therapist turned coach who works with transgender, non-binary, questioning folks feeling lost while transitioning their gender identity. They are the creator of Gender Fuck, the club, a one-of-a-kind research-based online group coaching community of transgender, non-binary, questioning folks who are on a mission to transition with less suffering and more ease. Ray is the founder of Practical Audacity, a gender and sex therapy practice in Chicago. They also provide training for medical and mental health professionals wishing to uplevel their knowledge in trans-affirming care. Ray holds a Master's of Education in Community Counseling. To learn more, visit Gender Fuck Club. That's G-E-N-D-E-R-F-C-K dot club. But first... Guess what, Chip? What, Dip? Today, we received an email from a listener asking what dating apps we recommend for couples who want to have a threesome. And guess what I said? Well, you've been raving about Field, so... That's right, Field. Field is one of my favorite dating apps for couples and singles. It was originally designed for people seeking threesomes. And while it's still the biggest dating app for threesomes today, Field offers that and so much more as they actually encourage you to embrace your sexual side. But how? Well, Field offers a platform for folks to share desires and interests directly on their profile so people know exactly what they're into. You can choose from a wide array of desires from cuddling and long kisses to BDSM and shibari to threesomes and polyamory and more. But what if I don't want to have a threesome or identify as kinky? No problem because Field is all about shame-free individuality so you can share about your sexuality no matter what you're into. And here's some more great news. I want more. You can download the Field app for free and support our show by using the link in the episode's description. Just click the link in our episode and get the Field app for free today. Chip? Wait, what? what? I'm downloading the app. But you're supposed to say, and now it's interview time. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was busy. Oh, well, it's interview time. All right, everyone. It is interview time, and we are here with Ray McDaniel. And you already heard a little bit in the bio, so we will just dive right in. Ray, we always start with the same or similar question with our guests. If you can tell us about your journey of coming to embrace yourself as a transgender and non-binary individual, as well as how your path led you to the work that you offer. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Mm -hmm. My path has been very long and windy and kind of strange. So my X-Men origin story is that I'm the adopted child of evangelical Southern Baptist missionary puppeteers. Oh. Yeah, oh. quite a mouthful. And so I grew up with them on the road. I spent five years of my life in various trailers, motels, et cetera, traveling all around the U.S., sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with puppets. Um, so that was my origin. I went to a tiny little conservative college in Texas and knew there was always something that felt a little different. I knew I didn't quite fit in and I didn't know why. I didn't have the words for it. And once I got to undergrad, my best friends became the theater kids who also happened to be the only out-ish gay kids on campus. And I saw them coming out in this really oppressive environment. So I decided that I wanted to be a therapist that worked with the LGBTQ population. I escaped the Deep South to Chicago, where I went to grad school, and immediately started working on 
all the skills that I would need to be a therapist for the LGBTQ population. And pretty much as soon as I was driving the U-Haul along Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, it felt like I could breathe for the first time. And so within months, I came out as queer. I came out to my friends from college who were unsurprised, and it was very anticlimactic. Came out to my parents who were slightly more surprised, did not go well, as you can imagine. And then along the way, I probably about four or five years ago, I also started leaning into my non-binary identity a bit more. So I came out as non-binary. I started using they, them pronouns. I started testosterone. I changed my name. I uh, I just got top surgery in December, which is super Ooh. exciting. Ooh. Love it. And about three years ago in my professional trajectory, I also started my own group private therapy practice called Practical Audacity in Chicago. We have really blown up in the past three years, which is really exciting and also I think says a lot about the really big need that is out there for queer affirming providers. And I started noticing, number one, that I wanted to take the work that I was doing and get it out to a larger audience. There's also a ton of restrictions, as you know, for therapists, especially working across state lines. And growing up in the South, I knew that there were a ton of people all over the U.S. and all over the world who needed affirming care who could not access it who did not geographically have people in their area that could provide the care that they were needing. And so I started taking my therapeutic work and translating it into coaching. And so now I do a lot of coaching for trans and non-binary folks, helping them transition their gender with less suffering and more ease. I primarily do that through my program, Genderfuck. That's genderfck dot club, which is an online group coaching community for trans and non-binary individuals. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Mm. That's a good, that's, that's a good intro. And what about the puppets? Are they out of your life forever? Are you incorporating (laughs) them into any of this work? Because. Oh, good questions. You know, I had, I still had a bin of puppets for the longest time and I re-gifted them to my parents at some point a few years ago. So I'm like, I really don't see myself needing this again. Um, But, you know, who knows? I, life is long. The puppets may come back. It was like a Jesus puppet. It was a, it was like telling the story of the Bible. Is that a what you said? Baby Jesus. Yeah. In a, in a there whole wasn't a Jesus scene? puppet, but it was definitely kind of like Muppet style puppets okay. who would tell <laughs> Bible stories. Like a, okay. Oh, like got it. And yeah. puppets are different than marionettes, right? Because marionettes have yes. like the okay. Okay. No okay. strings. This yeah. this show actually is all about puppets. Yeah. Now. <laughs> uh, We're gonna learn that, so much. <laughs> that is fascinating. That is yeah. so. Thank you mm-hmm. for for that intro to who you are and all your offerings. You're doing incredible work, and I think I think it's important to dive into the questions about what it means to be transgender and non-binary for folks out there who may not know. Also, this is kind of a multi-layered question. Also, what is the current affirming language, and what language is non-inclusive and can also be harmful? Ooh, such good questions and a lot of questions. So let me try to break it down in a nutshell. So my general spiel at a a very top level of what is transgender, what is non-binary, starts with biological sex. So you pop out of the womb, the doctor says it's a boy or it's a girl. And I think some of us have some understanding that some people pop out of the womb don't fit squarely into either one of those categories and have some sort of difference in sexual development or are identified as intersex. What most people don't know, though, is that the number of people who pop out of the womb and don't squarely fit into these boxes that we've created of male or female, and that's on the basis of the appearance of the bodies, chromosomes, and the endocrine system or your hormones is roughly the amount of people in the world who are redheads or put another way, twice the population of Canada. Mm -hmm. So what that says 
is that we have created an entire binary system of gender built upon a supposed foundation of binary biological sex as male or female that the more we learn from science is actually not supported. We're learning more and more about the diversity of biology when it comes to sex assigned at birth. And you see this in the, the animal kingdom as well. It's not unusual. And so building on that foundation, kind of shaking up a little of what we thought we knew, is gender identity. And gender identity is a, a deeply felt sense of your gender. So sometimes that matches up with the gender that you were assigned at birth. So if you pop out of the womb, the doctor says it's a girl, you grow up and say, yep, I identify as a woman, that feels great to me. Then you are cisgender, that's C-I-S. And cis is simply a Latin prefix that means on the same side as. So let's say option two, you pop out of the womb, the, the doctor says it's a girl, and you grow up and say, well, that doesn't really feel like it fits. I identify as a man. Then you would be a transgender man. Trans, Latin prefix, it means on the other side as. So on the other side of what you were assigned at birth. Option three, you pop out of the womb, the doctor says it's a girl, and I'll share my personal story here because this is how I identify, and I grew up and woman felt pretty okay, but not 100%, but I knew that I didn't identify as a man. That also did not feel right. I identify somewhere squarely in the middle as non-binary. And people use a lot of different language. It's constantly evolving to describe all sorts of identities, but especially identities that fall under the non-binary, genderqueer, gender fluid spectrum. The non-binary is just the one that feels best for me. And third level, if we want to build on gender identity and sex assigned at birth, is gender expression, which is simply how we want to express our gender to the world. And that's a question for everybody, whether you are cis or whether you are trans, we all get the opportunity to decide how do we want to show up in the world and how do we want to express our gender. So that's the quickest and dirtiest guide mm -hmm. to gender identity. You had asked about affirming language. So I just gave you some affirming language. Some other pieces that might be important. Queer is a term that gets thrown around a lot that I think some people don't quite understand. I don't know about you, but I grew up in the deep south where my grandma and my parents use queer as an insult. And a lot of people are still in areas where it can be used as an insult, but it was reclaimed in about the mid-90s as both an identity category and a field of study. So for example, I identify as queer. I can also go take a, a class in queer theory. I can read a book on queer theory. It's We use it in much the way that we use the term feminist, right? You can be a feminist. You can go study feminism. It's It's both. And it really, the term queer emphasizes fluidity and flexibility of identity and identity categories. Essentially says, we've put human beings into boxes. Those boxes are not generally super helpful. Why don't we take people out of tiny boxes and give them options to express themselves and identify themselves in ways that feel good for them, which may or may not change over their lifetime. Another term that I think is really important is transition. So when we think about gender transition, a lot of people think of this very defined path, and we can maybe call it the Caitlyn Jenner path, right? You were assigned male at birth in this example, you grow up, and then you transition medically, legally, and socially. You change your name, you change your name legally, you change your gender markers, you go through medical transition. And specifically in this narrative, when people think of medical transition, they think of bottom surgery of some kind. And I want to bust some myths about transition and say that you can be trans, you can identify as non-binary and not do any of those things. 
You might not want to medically change anything about your body. You might not want to express yourself any differently than you do today. You might not want to change any sort of legal things about yourself. And none of that negates a trans identity. So I view gender transition as simply moving into the most authentic version of you, whatever that means. So that might include social, medical, and or legal transition, but it might not. And it can also go really fast, which is often a tip of the iceberg type of thing. So it looks like transition is going really fast from the outside, but typically there is a lot underneath that. And that person has been sitting on those feelings for a very long time, or it can go super slow. There is no A to B. You have to get to this point to be transitioned. It's really whatever feels good to you. So I've just thrown a lot at y'all. Yeah. Is that all making sense? Are totally. There super helpful. Are questions so far? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and then I was also wondering, I think April already asked this too, but so, because I think a lot of people are still are using language that is non-inclusive and they're unaware, or maybe they are aware and they're still using it. So mm-hmm. what would you, what would be some examples of what that might look Things like? to avoid, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great questions. So language is constantly changing. So I could tell you things to avoid right now that may not be exactly right in in three months. So I'm not the end-all be-all on language, but I can give a a few tips. One that is a personal pet peeve, so I always like to mention this one, is using the term transgendered. So in the same way that we wouldn't say my Asian friend, Matt, it also doesn't make sense to say my transgendered friend, Sally. So if you are referring to someone who is transgender, call them a a transgender person, a transgender woman, or a transgender man, or better yet, unless their trans identity is relevant, I question why it needs to be mentioned. Unless you're letting somebody know about someone's pronouns or there's something relevant uh, about that. Another thing that people get tripped up on, which is a pretty obvious one, is asking about medical transition. So my go-to rule is if you didn't talk about someone's genitals before, you probably shouldn't talk about them now unless that person has explicitly invited you into that conversation. Um, yeah, super helpful. That, yeah, I think yeah. that's and and then uh, what about uh, in terms of pronouns? Because I, I remember that it used to be what pronouns do you prefer, and now there's more conversations about well, it's not necessarily this preference choice point. What do you use? Um, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. And and I know you're saying you're not the end all of language, but what's the current conversations around that? Yeah, I love that one. This is one that's been popping up more and more is people aren't really using the term preferred anymore in the same way that we're not using sexual preference to describe somebody who is queer. What we want to stay away from is any language that insinuates that being trans, being non-binary is a, a choice or it's simply a preference. So instead of saying, what is your preferred name, which might feel strange to, let's, we'll use our mythical person, Sally here again. If Sally's legal name is Sally, it might feel strange if somebody asks, well, what's your preferred name, Sally? Um, It's just, what is your name? The name that you go by, that's all it is. And what pronouns do you use? It can be just as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we started this this call too, I, I said it to you, I just went into saying April and I use she, her pronouns and, and I had read your bio. So I said, mm-hmm. I, I believe you use they, them pronouns, correct? And you said yes. And uh, and But I already had read your bio. So I had some information there to, to work with. And I think a lot of people shy away from it. You know, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And um, that I guess that's a, the, one of the invitations that I had to learn and will still continue to learn about is sometimes we make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes and correct yourself. I've had to do that over the years in my work so many times and it wasn't harmful. I wasn't being harmful. It's just we're habitually 
growing up in this very boxed reality of what mm-hmm. humans fit into, right? And it's not so either or. There's mm-hmm. a whole different spectrum for folks to like check in with. And I love that it's evolving and people are accepting and trying. So yeah. be gentle with yourself out there. Uh, and I think that was that was really, that's good information that you just provided as well. When I love that what you said, Ray, about it's constantly changing too. And mm-hmm. I, I think we get locked into this is what I know now and this must be true. And then when it changes later, it can be really frustrating. How did it change? It Even was this. When, now when you this. started training, things have changed. We, like if with It your, was a like male bodied and female yeah. bodied. And now yeah. we're saying penis owner and vulva owner or bits. And we're just saying mm-hmm. some, some neutral terminology for genitals. And yeah. uh, and I we've had people have, that have said, you know, I bet those people have already tuned out on this podcast this episode um who are have a hard time with uh the inclusivity and like the political correctedness and we just stand by it we're not backing down from that because it's important to meet people where they're at and respect their needs and we get to choose for ourselves if you all don't want to take that on for yourself that's fine uh, but if someone else if someone is making a request for how they want to be seen met or addressed that's that's important for us to do that just as we'd want someone to do that for us um, so what and yeah, and br- which brings me to a question that's kind of on that note. What are some of the current issues that trans, uh, non-binary folks are facing? Perhaps you see maybe with your clients and groups that you work with. Yeah, well, I think the most obvious one right now is that there is a record number of anti-trans legislation bills that are trying to be passed or being passed right now in the United States, and um, that. You know, I really think that it's a reaction to the Trump years. Like people are really trying to hang on. And this is one of the new targets, unfortunately. Um, So there's a lot of anxiety about that. There's a lot of fearfulness that comes from being in a culture and a society where there are literally laws that are being passed against your right to protection, your right to housing, your right to play on the sports teams that you want to play on, your right to go to the bathroom safely. That cultural narrative makes it a really scary thing sometimes to come out as trans or non-binary. Another thing that I'm seeing that it is very timely is the impact of quarantine and the past year and a half, which we're all dealing with. But one of the things that I've seen in the people that I work with over the past year or so is that being home, if they are in a place where they can safely be at home, and be around people that are affirming. A lot of people are working from home. So they have more of an opportunity to play with gender identity and specifically gender expression because there hasn't been as much pressure to be out in the world, to go into the office, to be at work. And so I think a lot of people are coming out of the pandemic with a newfound sense of who they are and what they want out of their life. And now they're being faced with, well, now I have to go back out in the world. So how do I do that? How do I take me feeling better in my own skin, the gender expression that I've been experimenting with, and do that in a way that feels good in the areas of my life that I want to be out in? Mm. And along that note, I think microaggressions and aggression. We know that specifically trans women of color get a lot of violence that is directed their way. And every year, I hope that I don't have to repeat the stat that the previous year was the worst year on record for anti-trans violence. And I've been talking about this since 2016. And every year, I say the previous year was the highest year on record. So we know that there are a lot of systemic things that are going on that make it really difficult to be a trans person in the U.S. There's a lot of medical gatekeeping. At the same time, we're also seeing more and more rhetoric around non-binary identities. We're seeing more and more positive media representation. You know, a lot of big celebrities are coming out as non-binary. We have uh, our non-binary binary or trans. We have Elliot Page. We have Demi Lovato that just came out. So people are, I think, being 
are being made aware of trans identities in a new way. And the conversation is shifting so that there is more acceptance generally. And I think that tends to come with a a backlash a little bit. And I think on a more personal note, and along with the the theme of this podcast, relationships and sexuality for people who are are trans and non-binary. It is a, a huge place of a ton of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty, and fear. You know, fear of not being lovable, fear of being alone. And that can be scary. This podcast was made possible by Helix Sleep. Shameless fact about me. One of my favorite things to do in life besides hot sexy is deep sleepy. And since most people spend one third of their life sleeping, why not nurture yourself with a mattress that was matched to you? Enter Helix Sleep. I was having hot sexy and not so deep sleepy on a saggy, uncomfortable mattress for years until I finally found my Helix mattress. I took the two minute sleep quiz and found the perfect mattress for my body type and my sleep preferences. I was matched the midnight mattress and it's everything I've ever dreamed of keeping me cool because I am a sweaty sleeper. Plus, it provides the right amount of support for all my sex and sleep positions. Finding the right mattress can be like finding the right sex toy. Everybody is different with specific needs, so why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? Helix has a mattress for everybody, whether you like it soft, hard, cool, cushioning, or you have a partner with totally different sleep preferences. Helix will fit you to the right mattress for all of your sleep needs. Just go to helixsleep.com shameless, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com shameless. Go check it out. This podcast was also made possible by OMGS.com. OMGS is a research-based online program that teaches you all about how to pleasure the pussy. OMGS studied thousands of vulva owners to find out how they orgasm and then made beautiful animated modules and super honest short videos to give you ways to reach even more pleasure. I've been recommending OMGS to my clients for years and it's been changing their lives. We all know pleasure is fluid and ever-changing, so why not add more tools to your pleasure tool belt? OMGS is for everyone, so whether you are a vulva owner or you just love vulvas, OMGS will give you the techniques to get your O face on. There are two seasons to choose from and hundreds of gorgeous videos to explore. So go see what science says about pleasure and visit omgs.com slash shameless. That's omgs.com slash shameless to get $5 off your OMGS access. Again, omgs.com slash shameless. Go check it out. Now back to the show. I think... There, we've come a long way in, in, in terms of, I think, creating space and openness compared to when I was growing up, right? And um, I think we've come a long way with uh, the, the, having bathrooms in places, especially in, in Santa Cruz, being all gendered bathrooms. Mm-hmm. And also, I, I, and I'm only touching on this because I think that it, a lot of times if there's safety for, for children that are growing up and feel that they aren't cis or they're, they're not assigned that, that, uh, the gender that they received, uh, on their birth certificate or Mm -hmm. something. Uh, and, and parents out there or people or guardians can really create safety in, in acceptance. I think that's important. My neighbor where I live uh, has, uh, um, a non-binary, um, child and they've supported them since they, uh, revealed this. And I was so, grateful to the, to the parent. And I said, thank you for that because we need more folks out there that have this, this acceptance for allowing people to, to be where they are. So it does start not only from folks listening out there that, that care, but, uh, but also just, um, the the people that you're, you're taking care of, you're nurturing and, uh, that, that love hopefully breeds more love. Right. And acceptance. So, yeah, I, I and I feel you. There's still a long way to go, Ray, and and I know in, in that statistic that you um, shared it, that it just it breaks my heart. Yeah. And my heart sinks. Well, it's wild to see. I mean, we live in California, <sighs> yeah. so it's wild to see that there's these ways that we're like, oh, it's getting getting better, more inclusive, and then there's these ways you're saying the statistics get worse every year too. At the same time, um, mm-hmm. so it's, that's just really interesting to to see. And I know it's different. I mean, even in California, there's terrible things oh, yeah. that happen. So everywhere, we're not protected, especially. But, yeah. yeah, so it's everywhere, and it's both. 
you know, it is getting better. It is. And there's a backlash. Mm-hmm. Well, and I also wonder uh, just in, in terms of the statistics, because this is why statistics are tricky, if there's more folks coming out and and revealing themselves. And so mm-hmm. there's more people, which leads to more episodes of the violence and the, 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 the those pieces. I don't know either way. It's it's not it's not a good statistic. It's just that's what I, yeah. my, more my brain went. I'm like trying to be an optimist here, <laughs> but it's hard. So yeah. Uh, let's let's hope it That's continues to yeah. decline. That's the whole goal here. Is that, by the way, I was wondering if that is a global statistic or if that's more a United States statistic. Right now, the statistics the statistics I know of are in the United States. Um, mm-hmm. There probably are some global statistics, but I don't know of them. I also think it's not quite as well tracked. You know, mm-hmm. other countries have and other cultures have different ways of even conceptualizing trans identity. So I, I think there's some difficulty in getting clear numbers. I was, I was just curious. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, so, okay. So moving on to another question, which this, this, is, uh, this is a tough question. And uh, we haven't really talked about it yet, but it is part of what we wanted to speak to you about. So let's talk about uh, what body dysmorphia is and also... What are some ways, uh, maybe you can share some tips on how folks can work with this if they're experiencing this? Yeah, great question. So I think coming from a therapist lens, I want to be very careful to separate body dysmorphia from gender identity. So body dysmorphia is often a term that we hear in the eating disorder world, and it isn't an actual mental health diagnosis. It's a a misperception that your body is flawed and must be fixed, usually without any basis in reality. So at its most extreme, I think the typical image you think of is somebody who is struggling with anorexia, who is very, very thin to an unhealthy point, and they think that they're fat. So that is body dysmorphia. It's like looking into a a funhouse mirror, not being able to accurately perceive of yourself. Gender dysphoria, however... It's tricky because it is in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So it is technically a diagnosis, but the difference is that gender dysphoria itself is not the problem. It is distress about being assigned a gender that does not feel congruent with who you are. Mm. So being trans, being non-binary and experiencing a sense of dysphoria in your body, that is not a mental health disorder. What we are treating and the reason we have a diagnosis is so that trans people can get the care they need for the distress that comes with their their bodies um, not really feeling completely congruent with who they are. So I want to make that distinction, first of all. So when we're talking about gender dysphoria, we're talking about a sense, usually a a body-based sense, that your body isn't quite right or congruent with the person that you know yourself to be, with your gender identity. And I think one of the biggest things that I've learned over the years is that we talk about loving yourself and loving your body, and that's important. But self-love doesn't always mean that you need to love every part of your body all the time. I think we have all had these experiences where we wake up one morning and we just don't feel great in our body and we don't love everything about it when really we didn't look much different than the day before. But it's just at this internal sense that something feels off. And in those moments, instead of shoving down I don't love how I feel in my body right now and getting into this toxic positivity place that doesn't really feel true, right? Hyping yourself up about how you love your body when you don't 100% feel that can, it can push away those negative feelings in ways that aren't generally helpful. So what I say instead is to accept where you're at, accept those feelings that you're feeling and show kindness and care to your body anyway. 
So loving yourself in those moments can look like saying, I'm going to make sure I hydrate today because that is care for my body. I'm going to put on clothing that is really comfortable and that feels really good to me. And that's how I'm going to care for my body today. It might mean, well, I don't love how my body looks today, but I love how it feels when I dance. So I'm going to have a solo dance party in my living room. I'm going to go for a walk with my dog and show gratitude that I can see, that I can feel the the ground underneath my feet, that I have access to pleasure in my five senses, no matter how I feel about my body at this particular time. So instead of shoving those negative feelings down, it's more of just being kind to them that often helps us get out of that really negative body space. I think that's so helpful. It, it drives me crazy when I hear people, you have to learn to love everything about you or, or love yourself before you can love someone else or mm-hmm. all the, and it feels so limiting because people are like, but I don't love everything about me. And it, not just their body, their, you know, their being. And I like that focus of, of kindness and also, uh, it, I guess, em, not necessarily embracing, but not running away from the challenging stuff, mm-hmm. the parts of yourself that you do struggle with, and also being kind and trying to embrace the pieces that you can find some way of liking or enjoying. Uh, and a lot of it sounds very embodied uh, practices. Yeah. And I just want to be clear that I understand. So when you say body dysmorphia, we're talking more for eating disorders, um, more in, in that realm and not about gender identity. And we're talking right. about gender identity. You said it's dysmorphia or dysphoria? Dysphoria. 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 So it's gender dysphoria. dysphoria. Got dysphoria. it. Okay. Mm-hmm. I just want to make sure that that's so okay. Great. Because I just learned, I've learned so many new things today. This is great. I actually was hoping <laughs> I didn't misread the question. And no, then, no, that and was, then I wrote that. that yeah. Was, yeah that no, that was, was my question. Yeah. yeah. That was that's a yeah. good clarification. Well, we yeah. Yeah, totally, totally helpful. And I've and I I've had uh, clients that have said I have body dysmorphia, and I want we don't want to shame clients for using that for themselves too. If that's how how you're um, speaking to your body as um, a trans individual, then that's yeah. okay for you to to do. But we're just clarifying here, and also helpful for me to know to to speak to. Um, speaking of, I have a question from a listener for you. All right, <laughs> I'd love for you to answer since we have the doctor on the phone or the call. We're on the phone. (laughs) Okay. So I have a friend who is a trans woman and she has recently had bottom gender affirming surgery. She's so excited to get to explore sex with her new vagina. Woo! Do you have any tips or toy suggestions to help her on her way? Well, first of all, huge congratulations to this listener. That is such a big deal. It's so exciting. So whoever this is, if you're listening to this, I'm very, very thrilled for you. So a few things that I thought about when I got this question. First of all, listen to your doctor. They know what's going on when it goes when it comes to healing and resuming sexual activity before you are fully healed is not a good idea. So I know that you're super excited about your new vagina. I want to take it on a test run, but go slow. Make sure that you get the go-ahead from the doctor to resume the type of sexual activity that you want to resume. The other thing that is absolutely essential for new vaginas is the dilator process. So it's not always the most fun part, but it is really important, especially depending on what type of sexual activity you want to have. So that skin, while it doesn't balloon out and lubricate in the way that somebody who was was born with a vagina has, it is elastic. So that skin can stretch. The dilator process can really help stretch the skin, however big that you are wanting that to be. So that's a, a, a big one. The dilator process, like I said, is not always the most fun, but as soon as you're at a place where you're not in that very right after surgery healing process, you might be able to switch up some of those dilators and play around with sexual pleasure while you are doing that. So I I recommend that people, if they have the ability to do this, get different size vibrators and different shape vibrators and use that as part of your dilator process to explore pleasure while you're also doing this doctor-ordered activity that you have to do a a few times a day. 
Mm. Would you recommend lubrication in that as well? A hundred percent. Okay. Yes. I was going to get to that. Mm. Lubricate, 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 lots of lubrication. I would also say a water-based lubricant just because it is going to be easier to clean out, especially as you are healing. You don't want anything in your your vaginal cavity that is going to cause any sort of issues with the the sutures or, or any sort of healing process. So water is just going to help you make sure that you're able to clean up after sexual activity. The doctor can also let you know what sort of lubricants they recommend, but there's lots of really excellent water-based, high-quality lubricants out there. Lubricant is worth splurging on if you have mm-hmm. that ability. Do not go for the drugstore stuff if you can avoid it. Um, a few other things I think are really helpful is to go slow and to recognize that you have a new sexual landscape. So your body feels and looks really different. So it's going to take some exploring to get to know it, to get to rediscover what it is that you like, what pleasure feels like now. And so give yourself time and space to explore. Don't rush towards orgasm. Give yourself, number one, time for your body to get aroused, But also explore not just your genital area, but all of your body. Give all of your body a chance to respond to the pleasurable sensations that you are feeling. I also talk a lot about queering it up when it comes to sex and and sex toys and sexual roles. You know, we often get caught up in these ideas of what it means to be a man or a woman in the bedroom, to put in a very binary way, or what it means to be masculine or feminine in the bedroom or in sex. And being able to step out of that and simply ask yourself, what do I want? What type of sensations do I want? Who do I want to show up to this particular sexual situation as? Whether that is solo sex, whether that is with a partner, you don't have to go by whatever prescribed sexual script our society has given us for what sex has to look like, what sort of activities it involves. We experience sex with our entire bodies and that is, I think, even more important when you're exploring this new vagina that you have and this new sexual landscape that you have is to explore the entire landscape and not just one area. Hmm. I love those tips. I think that's all super helpful. Uh, And then, and I I love, especially the things you said also about not all lube is created equal, definitely spurge on lube, uh, because we're talking about your bits. This absorbs, Mm -hmm. your bits absorb lots of things that you put in them. So it's a, it's an area to, especially after a surgery to be extra cautious and kind. Yeah. Yeah. Take good care of yourselves. Um, uh, One brand that I like, I mean, I like organic, it becomes a water-based, I like organic products and, Mm -hmm. uh, and I like ingredients that are only have like six things at the most on and it. also it, yeah. staying away from petroleum oh, yeah. products yes, because yeah. people think, oh, this Vaseline or also this olive oil, it's in yeah. my, or this coconut. Sometimes that can be not so helpful for healing yeah. um, folks mm-hmm. that are healing. Yeah. There's a lot of great options on our uh, website with my mom and I. We have a sex shop, everyone. If you go to purepleasureshop.com and use coupon code SHAMELESSSEX, you get 15% off. There's actually a sexual health and wellness section where there are dilator sets uh, and there's also um, also a lube section there where you can find all kinds of organic lubes. I think Slick would make Excellent. some really nice clean products as well that I think are great, like their organics line as well. But I like what you said to talk to your doctor because um, although, uh, let me ask you this. This is a part, part, question I have about this. So, because a lot of doctors, I think they actually are sending their customers, I'm sorry, their patients to sex shops to find out about lubes, but they don't actually know about the lubes. But are you saying for doctors that are working with trans folks might actually know more about this than like your average gynecologist? Not necessarily. Uh, honestly, I think that the sex toy shop owners will pretty much always know way more than the mm-hmm. doctors. Yeah. I would trust them over the doctors. There are lots of really incredible sex toy stores that have sex educators that are in charge of them. Lots of great blog posts. It is mm-hmm. easy to find if you just look. Yeah. 
Totally. And you could also, as, as just a, a, a suggestion, I used to do this uh, at my gyno, uh, and I'm sure other doctors would, if there's a lube that you found that works well for you, that also feels good, you could bring that in or suggest that mm-hmm. for your doctor. Oh, they're doing exams? Well, oh, no, oh, also to teach them. To teach oh. them. So if someone comes and asks them, yeah. they know and, and uh, they, they, they know what to recommend to other folks because yeah. I, I used to do that because the, the lube that they were using was so... Uh, not my cup of tea when I was uh, yeah. it, you know, getting uh, anything the jelly? inserted. <laughs> well, they actually had a lube from oh, a lube company because oh. they were friends with someone that worked there and mm. it was not my favorite and it, it didn't feel good. And, and so I would bring in my own lube. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I know yeah. that they could totally do that. If yeah. you're if you're a person that is uh, uh, talking to your doctor, sometimes you can teach your doctor things too. Mm-hmm. So that was just my suggestion. And um yeah, Even the people in lab coats could learn some things. Yes. And that, that, those yeah. doctors, those doctors could actually reach out to the lube companies and get samples oh, yeah. to give to folks. Like the, that is, so this is all side. Uber note. Lube does it. I mean, Uber Lube yeah. silicone. So with what you're talking yeah. about, you weren't, that wasn't what you were referring to. But for Uber Lube, sends samples to any doctor that asks because they, I mean, they have a great product, but not specifically for what you're talking about now. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, like April said, they can reach yeah. out. And so I, I, I like when there's education about, for folks about don't put your doctor, the person, in the lab. Coat, the researcher on a pedestal because even they have room to learn and everyone is different. I educate my doctors every time I go in yeah. because about, and I love doctors. about bodies and sex yeah. and sex toys and pleasure and they're always like, huh, yeah. okay yeah. then. <laughs> they like, get listen a to lot episode less. 125. They do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they get a lot less sex education than we think they do. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Absolutely. Uh, and so that's just a good point on all spectrum and pure pleasure shop is it, they do have like, you have some good categories for yeah. folks. And out there's there. a lot of wonderful sex positive sex shops in your, in, well, not all cities. That's why we have online stores because a lot of people don't yeah. live in cities that have them. So if you're in a city that has one, go check it out and you can learn a lot there too. And if you have questions about products, you can always email us. Um, you can email me at amy at pure pleasure shop.com. I said that really quick. It's amy at pure pleasure shop.com. <laughs> uh, and I can help you find products too. But so, anyways, uh, another question, Ray, uh, for folks out there that if you have any tips, advice uh, to give folks that are considering or maybe they're already transitioning, uh, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. One of the first things that I tell people always is what I call building your army before you fight the war. So, finding your people. You know, Brene Brown talks about it in the the post-it note people. Who are the people in your life that you already have, that you know love and support you, that you can start with? So if you're early in the transition journey, find even one or two people in your life, if you can, that you can come out to, that you know will have your back, that you can text if you're having a bad day or something doesn't go right. I think that also applies when people are thinking about coming out at work or in other areas of their life. If there are even just a few people in that arena that you know or can reasonably assume are going to be supportive, I always suggest starting with those people first. Backing it up even further, if If you are transitioning currently or curious about your gender identity and expression, curiosity is your best friend. So I always encourage people to adapt an attitude of play. I call it spaghetti wall mode. You know, when you're cooking spaghetti, you throw it on the wall, see if it sticks. If it doesn't stick, it's fine. It's no big deal. You haven't failed. Your day isn't ruined. You just cook the spaghetti more. This attitude of play takes the pressure off for you to have all the answers and for you to know what point B is going to be. An attitude of play, it keeps you present. It keeps you connected to others. It is impossible to fail at play. You just simply cannot do it. Everything is just an experiment. And along that line, I also tell people to focus on the next tiniest, easiest step that is right in front of them. So what I see a lot is that people get very fixated on step 10, and they don't know what step 10 is going to look like. Step 10 feels really, really overwhelming to them. But if we back it up to step 0.5 or step one, it feels a lot less overwhelming. 
So for a concrete example, let's say I had a client who was interested in starting hormones. So they wanted to start testosterone, but they were very, very nervous about starting testosterone. I can't speak today. (laughs) Starting testosterone and didn't really know how they were going to feel on it. They weren't sure about the body changes or if they would like them or not. The first thing I would tell them to do is make an appointment with a doctor. Go talk to the doctor. You do not have to make any decisions, but what you can do is go get your questions answered. And you can then go home and see how you feel now that you've gotten some of those questions answered. Maybe step two is to get the prescription and bring it home and put it on your counter and just look at it for a couple weeks. See how you feel about it. What is it like having it there. Maybe step 2.5 or 3 is taking it out of the carton or even taking one dose of it and then seeing how it feels, even just your emotional reaction to taking that one little dose. And then from there, you take the next tiniest step. And if it doesn't feel good, that's fine. You can stop at any time. Hormones are not an escalator. You don't have to continue to go up. You can, you have way more control over the pace and over starting and stopping than I think people typically feel like they do. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example of a way that I would work with somebody. The other thing I would say is focus on how you want to feel instead of how other people perceive you. So most people who I work with who are early in the transition process, their goal is passing. And passing generally has a connotation of passing as a cisgender person. And there's lots of reasons for wanting to pass, including safety, including just wanting to go to Target or the bus stop without being looked at. Legit completely. There's nothing wrong with the goal of passing. But whenever you're, uh, what word am I looking for? Your measure of success is if your grocery store clerk that you don't know accurately genders you, you're setting yourself up for failure because your locus of control is outside of you. So if your point for transitioning is that you want to transition into the most authentic version of you and have your body and the way you present in the world reflect that most authentic version of you, that is setting you up for success. Hmm. And it feels awesome when other people validate that. That is incredibly important. And all us allies out there, that is a very, very important thing. And it cannot be the only measure of success. And I will also say this. So a lot of people get caught up thinking about passing, or I like to call it blending, as this is how I will become valid. This is how I will be seen as the person that I am. And what we know is that being seen as the person that you are is a very, very important thing. It's important for our self-esteem. It's important for our sense of self. But there are people out there that however you look today in the body that you have right now, that you can tell them who they are, who you are, and they will believe you. And they will affirm you today without you changing anything about yourself. That is accessible for you right now. And I think holding on to that piece is one of the most important pieces of resiliency that I have seen in my clients. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, so what I'm hearing is uh, is that the uh, affirmations, if you're seeking affirmations from people or the blending or the passing, that's a valid piece. And that's a little more of a, like a bonus for your intention there. That's, that's mm-hmm. something that will feel really good and be good for your well-being and your self-esteem. And if that's the only choice, your only thing that you're seeking or relying on to feel good in your in your in your body, then you might you're saying it might be some um, expectations that you could 
get potentially get let down. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which, which I think is the case for worthiness in general for a lot of folks is relying on, and you know, out, even outside of talking about um, transgender folks, uh, that we're relying on other people to tell us we're good enough, we fit in enough, you know, we're mm-hmm. we're okay, we're beautiful, we're sexy, instead of finding it more so with ourselves. And I also don't want to take away from that being a thing. Like I want, I want that from the world, and I think that that's Absolutely. valid for for folks and for trans folks to want that in the world. And I can only imagine what it would be like to not feel safe walking into a bathroom and feel like I'm going yeah. to be judged, or people walking down the street and people looking at me because I they're not in their head trying to analyze me, figure out what kind of genitals I have, and uh, mm-hmm. making comments. I mean, I've heard these comments. Like, is that a, you know, what just things that people say that I'll bring back to the conversation? Things that are are harmful is is that a he is that a she and questions like why why do you need to to know this what is what in you is driving you to have to get this this answer uh, and for folks if that's something that you say or do uh, and that's something you want to learn more about and correct then I'm not going to hate on you for having that in your past but just to understand that that's not helpful that's I mean, you might have curiosity you might be confused uh you might have questions and it's not up for other folks to answer that's not the, you're, it's they're not your business and it's yeah. just not it's not being an ally i wanted to add one piece too that i was thinking about because uh ray you spoke to finding allies for folks that are um in uh, considering uh transitioning or maybe are already in in um process and if folks don't have allies this is when they can seek out support from folks like you and in your network and your in in your uh you know container that you can hold for these people because uh, unfortunately, some folks out there may not have allies close to them that they feel safe enough to to speak um, to this um, and to this truth about who they are. So, uh, I would like to encourage folks out there that are in that space to also find Ray, find um, mm-hmm. other outlets, and I'm sure you have other uh, connect, c- connections or, or recommendations for people. Um, which brings us to uh, the the last piece, unless you had anything to add. Uh, which is how can people find and work with you and any the, other resources? The gender fuck club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So first of all, to, to speak to what you said, yeah, not everybody has access geographically to people that are supportive. And there's a lot of really amazing online resources that are free out there. There are free Facebook groups. I have a free Facebook group that people can join if they don't have access to financially or it's not the right time to join a more formal coaching group. Um, But people can find me at genderfuck.club. That's genderfck.club. I have a newsletter on there I invite you to sign up for. You can also find me at Practical Audacity on all of the socials, especially Instagram. I invite you to connect with me there. And I'll also give all y'all a link to a special podcast resources. So if you want to know more about being an ally, if you want to know more about how I work with people, um, or you're interested in getting some training on this, that is the place to hit me up. Mm, So we can put that in our show notes that you'll send us the link and we can add it to the show notes for this podcast. Cool. Thank you. I just want to thank Ray for this really incredible podcast that I, I took away a lot of, of juicy nuggets there to, uh, uh, I, I think that I think we all can inspire each other to be better humans and inspire people to celebrate who they feel they are holy. And uh, that's really an important piece. And that's what pride I feel like this month, we're recording this in June is about celebration and um, mm-hmm. acceptance. And, uh, we're, and that's just what I want to put out. And uh, I, I hope that, that the world is, evolving into mm-hmm. this this space so thank you ray for mm-hmm. everything that you've shared with us um and if you want to celebrate with me y'all let's celebrate with some wine right because you know margin's wine <laughs> has some wine left Noise and she transition. actually always she always <laughs> runs out of wine and she 
had messaged us saying that she does have some uh, varietals left. And it always is changing and evolving because she takes just these underrepresented varietals from underrepresented regions, mostly in California, and makes beautiful boutique wines that are that are absolutely delicious to drink. So check out marginswine.com. Go ahead and just sign up for the newsletter. That's all you have to do. And you only get a couple a year and then you can at least try a bottle or two. But if you want to try three or more, you can save 10%. Just enter code shamelessx10. If you want to buy six or more, shamelesssex. 15, you'll say 15%. That's also on our website. So as, as will be the resources for uh, this podcast and what Ray has shared. So y'all, thank you again. And I love each and every one of you. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Ciao for now. Want to learn more? Go to shamelesssex.com. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use code shamelesssex at purepleasureshop.com.